she didn't show up for work and uh, Doug said, Herb, her house is on fire and there's accelerants. And that's kind of how the whole story started. How did his family react to all of this? They were traumatized. They never saw this coming. He's a monster. It's that simple. He'd been planning this for a while. The rigging of the gas line, the pouring of the accelerants, the brutality of the murders. For tangible evidence, we have the house, we have the ATM, we have the forerunner, and that's it. It's tough to make a puzzle with three pieces. This is True Crime Arizona, finding Robert Fisher in Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Well, I always said he was Daniel Boone. I'll never forget when he got a new quad and Mary came in and said, Robert wants to go quad riding with you. He wants to go up to Roosevelt Lake and this and that. Finally, I said, okay, I'll go, I'll go up there. So he was all excited, so I met him. We met, uh, both took our separate vehicles. We just went up into a, a campsite on Roosevelt. We were down a dirt road and he just pulled over and boom, there was our campsite. It was getting dark and uh, we parked and he wanted to sleep outside under the stars and I was more comfortable in my SUV. I, I just, I was, I, I remember I had my gun and I was very nervous, but what, you know, what's gonna happen? You, you know, everybody knows we went up here. It's the end of March 2001. Herb Greenback was two hours away from his home in Scottsdale, Arizona, and completely out of his elements in the dense pines. Nervous? Sure. But afraid? Not so much. He felt safe. He was with somebody who knew exactly what he was doing. I followed him, we went up, and then he showed me where he killed a coyote, and he showed me where he can find other animals, and he showed me a commune to where People could come and they could hide in there and you can't find them. Robert Fisher had been here many times. He too lived in Scottsdale, not far from Herb's family. But any chance he got, he'd escape to the woods near Young, a tiny, quaint northeastern Arizona town. Unlike Herb, Robert was in his element here, remote, rural, secluded. Herb said he could navigate the area on an ATV better than most. He left me. He took off because he was faster than me, and he left me in the dark. And I just kept going. I said, why does this guy do this, man? You know, and going down, the next thing you know, he sticks his arm out, and there was our campsite. I would have never found it. He popped a couple codeine. I had a couple beers, and uh, we went to bed. A couple codeine seemed a little odd, but Herb knew Robert had a back injury. He didn't think much of it. And we were eating breakfast, he was talking to some guy, and the guy said, yeah, he works in that city that's just south of Payson. Yeah, it's just before you get to Payson, it's where all the motor bicycles on the right-hand side. I can't think of that. That's where they thought they saw him in that bar. Rye. Rye. That's, yeah. This is what this guy did, and I would never forget this. He says, well, I work in Rye. He goes, well, what do you do? He goes, well, I lay tile. He says, I got a motorcycle. I can ride through the mountains. I can get to Rye in two hours. I work, and then I ride back. He says, well, is there, is, do you pass any houses? He goes, no, it's, you're, it's just like hunting. He said it was just out in the nature. And so we, we went on. Robert wasn't necessarily Herb's favorite person, but the trip ended up being pretty fun. In fact, Herb enjoyed it so much that at the end of their ride, before packing up their campsite to go home, he got on the two-way radio. And then I said, hey, Robert, that was pretty fun. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. And he says, no, we probably won't. I don't think I'll be doing this anymore. Was that the last time you saw him? Yeah, it was the last time I saw him. And then, two weeks later, everything happened. 94th Street North, there's just an explosion and a fire. Fire, big explosion. Can you see it? Big fire, you bet I can see it. Hi, we got a fire and a big explosion. I need to report a fire. Our house just exploded and ignited on fire. We got the call for a house fire. April 10th, 2001. It's about 8.30 in the morning. Scottsdale police detective TJ Duran knows the scene he's heading to in South Scottsdale isn't good. Okay, what's going on there? It's, it's a big fire. What? It's a really big fire behind. It just like blew up. Okay, what's on fire? The whole house. The whole house? The whole house is burning up. There are people yeah. in there and this whole house exploded. Were there people inside the house? Yes, there are. They're probably dead. 
This cul-de-sac looked like a bomb had gone off, igniting a massive explosion and fire. There wasn't much of a home left standing. People are standing outside their homes just watching, shell-shocked, as firefighters scrambled to put out the blaze. When TJ and another detective finally got to the scene, there wasn't much left to look at, let alone much standing. I think we have a homicide here. Those words changed everything. Mary Fisher, Robert's wife, was always very prompt. She worked for Herb Greenbeck and his wife, Lori. Herb gets a call from a friend who works at the fire department about Mary. She didn't show up for work. It was about 8.20, 8.30. And uh, he, Doug said, uh, Herb, her house is on fire and there's accelerants. And that's kind of how the whole story started. So we knew the house was on fire. She wasn't there, so we went over there as fast as we could. And the yellow tape was up. It was all, you know. We were like, come on, let's just blow through. We just ducked in and went down to right to, at the end of the cul-de-sac because the tape was at the end of it. We were at the bottom of the cul-de-sac where the house was completely just ash. And then we could hear, you know, they found one body, they found another body, and then we could start hearing through it. We were, we didn't understand why Robert's truck was still there and Mary's truck was, you know, we just couldn't put it all, all to get. So you're standing there in the cul-de-sac, the house is destroyed, and you're hearing there's bodies inside. Where's Robert? Did you think he was in there? Yes. I thought the whole family was. Detectives make a call to the Mayo Clinic, where Robert Fisher worked as a respiratory therapist. He didn't show up for work that day. Neither did Mary. The couple had two kids, 12-year-old Brittany and 10-year-old Bobby, both believed to be inside the house. Robert's truck was in the driveway, now charred and burned from the explosion. Mary's forerunner was missing. But there were only three bodies in the burned ruins of the home. Nothing was making sense, at least not on the surface. TJ Duran would play a key role in this investigation. So would two other Scottsdale detectives. Hugh Lockerbie, and I'm a lieutenant uh, with Scottsdale Police. Uh, my name is John Heinzelman, spelling H-E-I-N-Z-E-L-M-A-N, and I'm a homicide detective with Scottsdale Police Department. These detectives all have certain memories from the hours leading up to and after the Fisher family home explosion. Their stories intersect, piecing together critical moments as the investigation began to reveal layers of a facade. At the scene of the fire, TJ learns a piece of information about Robert and Mary that serves as a starting point. There was, I think that one of the neighbors heard them arguing that night. That was the night of April 9th. Insert Detective Hugh Lockerbie. The interesting thing about me is I was a patrol officer in 2001. I worked that part of the town of Scottsdale, uh, the city of Scottsdale, but my beat, my assigned area for this district that I worked out of was the home of Beat 3, was the home where the Fisher family lived. If a neighbor would have just called us to said, hey, there's a fight going on between Mary and Robert, I mean, I would have been responding to that. There was no call about an argument, though. There had never been any calls to police for arguments at the Fisher home. There was something odd about this house fire, though. In the search warrant, they say they found a firecracker in the home and in Brittany's bedroom, a battery attached to a wire and foil paper, possible ignition devices. There was a natural gas line that was disconnected, and it was just the matter of time before the amount of natural gas filled up the house to where it hit the flame and uh, it was enough to combust the house. This fire was no accident. This was intentional. Then the three bodies are identified. Mary Fisher, 12-year-old Brittany Fisher, and 10-year-old Bobby Fisher. Where is Robert? You're my family, Robert. I don't know what happened, Robert, whether you were a victim or whether you were a victim of Satan, because that can happen with some of the things that we won't go into now. But Robert, I love you, mom loves you. Mary's dad, Bill Cooper, made a public plea to his son-in-law. The Fisher family was deep-rooted in faith, they believed Robert was too. 
he was here with her. And I just, can I right now just say this? Robert, we love you. Wherever you are, Robert, please, we, under, we love you. Just, just come home, please, Robert. And I don't know what's going on. We don't know anything for sure, but we'd like to hear from you, please, Robert. Information was starting to come in from other people. He supposedly was having something to do with one of the people that worked over there, one of the women, and that she is missing, hasn't shown up for work. Was Robert having an affair? It was certainly possible, but that wasn't the concrete evidence investigators needed to locate him. He's now considered a person of interest in the case. And then finally, a clue at an ATM. That happens at 10.30ish at night. On the 9th, withdrawing $260, $280. Maxes out what he could take out at the time. Just down the street, a black and white surveillance camera at the ATM captures a series of still shots showing Robert Fisher wearing a ball cap, long sleeve t-shirt, pants, and hiking boots, getting out $280 in cash and getting back into an SUV, Mary's SUV, her forerunner, the car that was missing. Is there any record of any of that money being used anywhere? We have not found, um, well, tracking cash used to be next to impossible, but as far as, as far as we've found, we've never recovered any, there was no money found in the forerunner. There was no money found anywhere else that we knew of. Um, even the tips that came in, I don't, to my knowledge, I don't remember anybody saying that somebody came in and paid uh, a bill with cash. So um, as far as we know, that's, that's another one of these mysteries. Why, why 280? Why did you go to the ATM that night? And, and why haven't you taken any money out ever since? Those ATM pictures were taken about 10 hours before the Fisher home exploded. The question then is, what happened between the time Robert got money out of the ATM and the house exploded into flames? The first question that comes to mind is, did he go back home? That part was a blurry maybe to investigators, at least at first. The thing is, Mary, Brittany and Bobby didn't die in the explosion. They died before it. He slit their throats while they were sleeping in bed. He slit his wife's throat. And then the FU shot was the bullet in the head. We found several guns inside the house, but the one in particular that we are focused on was a revolver that he had that we had the case for and the case was empty. So we assumed that that was not only was it the, the murder weapon that he used um, on Mary, but that was probably the gun that he had taken with him then. These weren't superficial cuts to the throat. Mary, Brittany, and Bobby were nearly decapitated, believed now to be at the hands of Robert Fisher. Seeing them, lifeless, covered in blood and soot, that's an image T.J. Duran and Hugh Lockerbie have seared into their minds. That sticks with you. And that was a, a, a show of a crime. I mean, massive explosion. That wasn't a yeah. This is not a quiet just, crime. Right. I mean, the yeah, everything behind it, the the rigging of the the gas lines, the the pouring of the accelerants the brutality of the murders of the kids' throats being slit almost to the vertebrae, to the wife's, Mary's throats being slit and her, you know, the gunshot to the head, the, um, the charred remains of the bodies. I mean, just, you know, things that you just, you cannot unsee, but you also have a hard time wrapping your head around like what human would do something to the uh, like this he's a monster it's that simple he'd been planning this for a while this is not just a spontaneous moment in like oh you're leaving me and oh no you're not you know we're gonna fight we're gonna argue we're gonna do this xyz and then 
one thing leads to another, and oh shoot, you're dead. Um, and so you don't think he snapped? No, not at all. He planned this. He could have easily killed himself. I mean, if he wanted to burn the house down and burn the house down, but I believe that he did this as, as, a, as a way to start a new, new life because this was the way out. He thought that the house was going to burn to a point that no one would be able to recognize anyone and maybe he would just be lumped into the, the, the remains and therefore he's no longer on the run. So you think he thought? It's possible. No one was going to look for him. Well, yeah, I mean, because I'll say that, the, you know, he lived so close to the fire station had uh, the response from the fire department to get there to put the fire out was extremely quick. Investigators believe Robert Fisher killed his family, then went to the ATM and fled. He had hours and hours of time before that house exploded and before detectives had any idea what was going on. It became an all-out manhunt. We're just wishing that this would be coming to the head where we find Robert and we can help him. And we know the Lord is with him. That was Robert's mom, Jan Howell. Investigators immediately start asking his family questions. They needed to learn everything they could about who Robert William Fisher was. How did his family react to all of this when you're talking to them? I mean, they were traumatized as much as Mary's family. And that's understandable. You know, I mean, because they never saw this coming. They, they thought that their son, their brother, was this person that family-oriented individual, that you know, raising the kids, going to church, I mean, everything that they would want, you know, that they expected, to, that what they saw on the surface. They had no inclining. So when this happened, they were very traumatized by it. They were hurt, they were sad, they were angry. How could you do this? There was somebody who had an inkling about where Robert Fisher could be, Herb Greenback. I called the guy and said, I know where he is. Go up to Young, Young Road all the way up to go to your left, start veering, you're gonna find him. I guarantee he's up there. And that's how I spoke, just like I'm speaking with you. And you told this to who? That one of the Scottsdale policemen, you know, because he gave me his car. Call me if you have, if you think of anything. And you called them the night of the fire. Oh my fire. goodness! Yeah, I went out to the to the. Uh, I left the game and went out to where I could talk on my phone, and I called him. And I actually spoke to him. He, he answered his phone. Herb says he gave that tip to Scottsdale police the night of the house fire, but Herb's tip was just one of dozens coming in at a rapid pace. Scottsdale in the Phoenix area. Uh, Roosevelt Lake and that those areas, like by Four Peaks, the uh, Four Peaks Wilderness area. The days ticked by since the murders and explosion. One, two, three. Four. Feasibly at this point, Robert Fisher could be anywhere. Then came day ten. Herb Greenbeck knew what he was talking about. Do you wish they had followed up on your lead sooner? Oh, absolutely. I think every minute counted at that point. And they didn't end up finding the car until 10 days later. They're probably going on leads. Can't go everywhere everybody tells you. Today, authorities announced Fisher's Toyota 4Runner, which was first spotted here Friday in the woods near Young, may have been here for as long as a week. Yesterday, Fisher's dog, Blue, was still seen guarding the vehicle. Animal control officers captured him and treated the dog for injuries, apparently suffered from a fight with a porcupine. But Fisher himself was gone. Robert's dog was found alive. The hat Robert was seen wearing in the ATM video was found inside the forerunner. That had to mean Robert couldn't have been gone for long, but conditions in the woods in the middle of April weren't good. Snow covered the ground early this morning as Gila County Sheriff's deputies started their search. From the air, NewsHawk 5 spotted two White Mountain Apache Rangers following a set of footprints down into an area known as Chinook Springs. It's much easier to find someone who wants to be found. If someone does not want to be found, it's really difficult uh, to find someone, particularly in a terrain like this. 
nearly 200 law enforcement officers from different departments and agencies from all over Arizona helped with the search. Finding Robert Fisher was Arizona's top priority. They knew he had some chronic injuries that may have slowed him down if he ditched the car. Uh, if he's still on foot, we're, we're also basing his medical condition. We've been informed that he has a bad back and bad knees. It's going to be extremely difficult to try to uh, spot the sus suspect from the air using the helicopter just because there's so much, so much cover for him to hide underneath. That included dozens of caves that were in the area. We will be working through the evening. We do have a cadaver dog en route. We're going to be checking the, uh, the caves. There's always a chance that he's literally standing here watching us, and that's why our security people are still here. Watching the search on the news back in Scottsdale, it was haunting for Herb. He knew he had called police with the tip to check that very area where Robert's car was found. And yet being the one who was with Robert in the exact same area just days before, eerie beyond reason. I thought he was going to go lights and sirens the next day to, to Young because I had been there with him. I'm the only one that said I was with him that anybody can speak of. So maybe this, the guy that was with him might know. By no means did I think in two weeks he was going to kill his family. The snow fell as the days of the search lingered on, the largest manhunt for a suspect in Arizona history. But Robert Fisher had seemingly eluded police. Agents say Fisher could be anywhere. I don't think there's any reason to, to think that he's not alive. And just as things were wrapping up, they had a, a suspect fitting the description. A new a tip came across the police radio, the a reminder that the search is suspended but not over. This is simply another lead. If we have someone walking on the highway that fits a description, we'll go check it. Gila County Sheriff's deputies ended the search where they started it. At the mouth of a cave, Fisher was suspected of using for cover. As many as 140 law enforcement officers joined the search over the weekend, but today, the formal manhunt is over and the regular detective work will resume. It was a huge blow to the entire state. So many resources were put into this search. They had the ATM pictures. They found his dog alive. They found the car. They thought they had him. Back in Scottsdale, the morning began. Where the Fisher family home once stood was now a growing memorial. Brittany and Bobby's classmates and friends made posters, set out stuffed animals, candles, a basketball, things they both loved. One poster stood out in particular. It said, we'll be buddies forever, Bobby. Children here at Supai Elementary School had a special ceremony today for Brittany Fisher. On her birthday, they dedicated a little tree and a plaque. The plaque says, in memory of Brittany Fisher, we will never forget you, April 27, 2001. The community was planning for a funeral, but Scottsdale police detectives were working round the clock. Their goal, find Robert Fisher. That's when TJ Duran's phone went off. I got a call from a couple that was actually up there a few days before we found the truck and they were on the old young road. She told me that he was on the outside of the road and as she passed them, she looked at her husband and said, that looks like Robert Fisher. He was walking north towards Highway 260 on the Young Road. You know, he walked out of there. That's my belief. If Robert Fisher walked out to the highway and got a ride, well, he could quite literally be anywhere, anywhere in the world. If you've ever heard of the Robert Fisher case or seen pictures about it before, and you've probably seen the same two or three famous pictures of Robert and a portrait of the Fisher family. His wanted poster and face was plastered everywhere, in grocery stores, at gas stations, on light posts, on fences, at bars and restaurants. Robert Fisher has been a ghost, a man authority. His case ran on the popular TV show, America's Most Wanted, the goal was to get his image and likeness out there for the world to see, and fast. 
Hugh Lockerbie said all he could see in that family portrait seen everywhere was a face of evil and a smiling family masking fractured relationships underneath. But knowing like what we know family. now... It looks like a happy family. You see it in a different yeah. light. Now. Yeah, he's completely look at it differently. That's the thing about the you know domestic-related murders is you don't really see the what's underneath all of the, the, the problems in this family. You don't, under, you don't see the, the, the pain. You don't hear about, you don't, you don't, you don't see what's going through Mary's eyes and, 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 you know, what she's thinking. You know, the problem with it is, is Bobby and Brittany here have no idea of some of the things that are going on in the, you know, the mind of their father. They don't, and they, they're, they're portraying this extremely happy family. They go to church. We come to find out, well, it was Mary that loved church. The kids were in church. Robert Fisher's picture may have been everywhere, but the reality, this case was more or less at a standstill. For tangible evidence, we have the house, we have the ATM, we have the forerunner. And that's, and that's it. it. And that's it. It's tough to make a puzzle with three pieces. Nobody could predict what would happen next in this case. Tips, sightings, and even more leads began flooding in from nearly every corner of the world. So when I say thousands, it's probably close to 10 to 20,000. I think if you were to, if you could numerically add them all up, and I'm from Mexico, Canada, the UK, Brooklyn, New York. His dad is in Florida. You know, he had a California connection with the US Navy, in New Mexico, Colorado. He's from Florida, Texas, up into the Northeast into uh, Washington and then Virginia, from Payson and Sholo in that area into that, that rugged wooded area where his vehicle was found. Our proximity to the border really makes it a, an allure that he could have went to Mexico. He could have been a you know, bandito and, and, you know, and ran across the border and created a whole new life. We've received some things from Europe. I remember Guatemala. This is by far the most, the most attention that, uh, or the biggest case that we've had. Detectives were about to leave the U.S. because the jaws of every investigator dropped when one particular tip came in. This guy was close. I mean, it, it, was, it was concerning, you know, that it was like, this is, we, we, gotta, we gotta find this person like ASAP. Maybe he's just hiding in plain sight because I thought, I think we finally got him. Coming up on True Crime Arizona, Finding Robert Fisher. Let me see. Oh, it looks just like him. Doesn't it? Oh my God. Sergio, look at these. It looks just wow. like him. That does look like him. And I think that maybe was, that was a threat to him, her you independence. Think that he wanted full control? Yeah. We saw her as a bright and shining star among her peers, such a beautiful young lady, so precious, so unique, so special. She will be missed more than I can say. God must be thrilled to have her right now in his choir in heaven. I love you, Miria. I love you, Brittany. I love you, Bobby. What do you think of uh, looking at those really graphic pictures? It, I mean, it's just, I don't know. It's hard to look at. I mean, for one thing. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. This episode was edited by Mike Abbott. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona.